how to it, Trailblazers. You just caught me and my sweet girl Molly here just catching up on our Iron Giant reading. <clears throat> we thought we would read Chapter 3 to you guys. What do you think, Molly? You want to hear it? She agrees. All right, guys, so we're going to read Chapter 3, which what it's titled, What's to be done with the Iron Giant? So, the spring came around the following year, leaves unfurled from the buds, daffodils speared up from the soil everywhere, the grass shook new green points. The round hill over the iron giant was covered with new grass. Before the end of the summer, sheep were grazing on the fine grass on the lovely hill lot. People who had never heard of the iron giant saw the green hill as they drove past on their way to the sea. They said, what a lovely hill. What a perfect place for a picnic. So people began to picnic on top of the hill. Soon quite a path was worn up there by people climbing to eat their sandwiches and take snapshots of each other. One day a father, a mother, a little boy, and a little girl stopped by their car and climbed the hill for a picnic. They had never heard of the Iron Giant and they thought the hill had been there forever. They spread a tablecloth on the grass. They set down a plate of sandwiches, a big pie, a roasted chicken, a bottle of milk, a bowl of tomatoes, a bag full of boiled eggs, a dish of butter, a loaf of bread with cheese and salt and cups. The father got his stove going to boil some water for tea and they all lay back on blankets, munching food and waiting for the kettle to boil <coughs> under the blue sky. Suddenly, the father said, that's funny. What is? Asked the mother. I felt the ground shake, the father said. Here, right beneath us. Probably an earthquake in Japan, said the mother. An earthquake in Japan, cried the little boy. How could that be? So the father began to explain, explain how an earthquake in a far distant country that shakes down buildings and and empties lakes sends a jolt r right around the earth. People far away in other countries feel it as nothing more than a slight trembling of the ground. An earthquake that knocks a city flat in South America might do no more than shake a picture off a wall in Poland. But as the father was talking, the mother gave a little gasp, then a yelp. The chicken, she cried, the cheese, the tomatoes. Everybody sat up. The tablecloth was sagging in the middle. As they watched, the sag got deeper and all the food fell into it, dragging the tablecloth right down into the ground. The ground underneath was splitting and the tablecloth, as they watched, slowly folded and disappeared into the crack, and they were left staring at a jagged black crack in the ground. The crack grew. It widened. It lengthened. It ran between them. The mother and the girl were on one side, and the father and the boy were on the other side. The little stove toppled into the growing crack with a clatter, and the kettle disappeared. They could not believe their eyes. They stared at the widening crack. Then, as they watched, an enormous iron hand came up through the crack, groping around in the air, feeling over the grass on the either side of the crack. And there's the illustration, guys, of the hand coming through the crack. It nearly touched the little boy and rolled over backward. The mother screamed, run to the car, shouted the father. They all ran. They all jumped into the car. They drove. They did not look back. So they did not see the great iron head, square like a bedroom, with red glaring headlight eyes, and with the tablecloth still with the chicken and the cheese draped across the top of it, rising out of the top of the hillock, as the iron giant freed himself from the pit. When the farmers realized that the iron giant had freed himself, they groaned. What could they do now? They decided to call the army, who could pound him into bits with anti-tank guns. But Hogarth had another idea. At first, the farmers would not hear of it, least of all his own father. But at last they agreed. Yes, they would give Hogarth's idea a trial. And if they failed, they would call in the army. After spending a night and a day eating all the barbed wire for miles around, as well as hinges he tore off gates, and the tin cans he found in ditches, and three new tractors and two cars and a truck, 
The Iron Giant was resting in a clump of huge branches, almost hidden by the dense leaves, his eyes glowing a soft blue. The farmers came near along a lane and car so that they could make a quick getaway if things went wrong. They stopped 50 yards from the clump of elm trees. He was really a monster. This was the first time most of them had a good look at him. His chest was as big as a cattle truck. His arms were like cranes, and he was getting rust, probably from eating all of the old barbed wire. Now Holgarth walked up to the Iron Giant. Hello, he shouted and stopped. Hello, Mr. Iron Giant. The Iron Giant made no move. His eyes did not change. Then Hogarth picked up a rusty old horseshoe and knocked it against a stone. Clonk, clonk, clonk. At once, the Iron Giant's eyes turned darker blue, then purple, then red, and finally white like a car head's lights. It was the only sign he gave of having heard. Mr. Iron Giant, shouted Hogarth, we've got all the iron you want, all the food you want, and you can have it for nothing, if only you'll stop eating up the farms. The Iron Giant stood up straight. Slowly he turned, till he was looking directly at Hogarth. We're sorry we trapped you and buried you, shouted the little boy. We promise we'll not deceive you again. Follow us and you can have all the metal you want. Brass, too. Aluminum, too. And lots of old chrome. Follow us. The Iron Giant pushed aside the boughs and came into the lane. Hogarth joined the farmers. Slowly they drove back down the lane, and slowly, with all of his clogs humming, the Iron Giant stepped after them. He led through the villages. Half the people came out to stare. Half ran to shut themselves inside of bedrooms and kitchens. Nobody could believe their eyes when they saw the Iron Giant marching behind the farmers. At last they came to the town, and there was a great scrap metal yard. Everything there, everything was there. <clears throat> old cars by the hundred, old trucks, old railway engines, old stoves, old refrigerators, old springs, bedsteads, bicycles, girders, gates, pans, all the scrap iron of the region was piled up there, rusting away. There, cried Holgarth, eat all you can. The iron giant gazed, and his eyes turned red. He kneeled down in the yard. He stretched out on one elbow. He picked up a greasy black stove and chewed on it like a toffee. There were delicious crumbs of chrome on it. He followed that with a double-decker bedstead, and the brass knobs made his eyes crackle with joy. Never before had the Iron Giant each eaten such delicacies. As he laid there, a big truck turned into the yard and unloaded a pile of rusty chain. The Iron Giant lifted a handful and let it dangle into his mouth, better than any spaghetti. So there they left him. It was an Iron Giant's heaven. The farmers went back to their farms. Holgarth visited the Iron Giant every few days. Now the Iron Giant's eyes were constantly a happy blue. He was no longer rusty. His body gleamed blue like a new gun barrel, and he ate and ate and ate endlessly and here is the last illustration for this chapter thanks guys for reading along in the iron giant with me and miss molly we hope that you're loving our one book one louisa